Uh, great, shall we get started? Yes, okay, well, welcome everyone to the INSTAR Noon Seminar. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Colorado Boulder sits upon land within the territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. Further, I acknowledge that 48 contemporary tribal nations are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. Uh, Sarah Spalding will be introducing our speaker today, a U.S. GS Deputy Director Aparna Bamzai Dotson. So I'm going to pass this over to her. Thanks, Shoyli. And um, I'm delighted to have Aparna as my USGS colleague. And Aparna is the Deputy Director of the North Central Climate Adaptation Center, which is headquartered in the SEEK building. Um, in her role, Aparna undertakes stakeholder and partner engagement to identify strategic goals, outputs, and objectives. She's responsible for organiz organizing solicitation and review of research proposals. So have a look at the uh, North Cl Central Climate uh, website. She coordinates the efficient and effective co communication and collaboration among different funded projects. Um, Aparna has a BS in statistics and mathematics from Virginia Tech, a master's in environmental management from Duke with a focus on global environmental change. And she's currently pursuing her PhD um, con you know, concurrently uh, with all these other activities through the Department of Geography and Environmental Stability at the University of Oklahoma. Her dissertation focuses on the production of actionable climate adaptation science between researchers and stakeholders. So I'm pleased to introduce Aparna Bamzai Dodson, who's going to be speaking to us today about engaging with stakeholders to produce actionable science, a framework and guidance. Thank you, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and just uh, chime in if you can't, if it doesn't show up properly. Okay. Looks, looks good. Okay, so I just want to thank you all for the invitation today and your attention um, for this talk. And I thought I would mention that my Twitter account is at a bombsite Dodson in case any of you are also on the platform and would like to comment on any part of this talk or to start up a conversation. Um, in addition to the land acknowledgement provided before, I'd like to provide my own acknowledgement. Uh, I'd like to honor and respect the connection that tribal and indigenous peoples have as caretakers of the lands that comprise the United States of America, both as a result of historical ties to their homelands and as a result of settler and colonial policies. I also honor and respect the connection of African peoples and their descendants as caretakers of these lands as a result of over 400 years of forced enslavement and subjugation. I strive for my work to be actively anti-racist and to counter colonial and parachute science. I am always interested in expanding my knowledge and skills related to these topics and would welcome any future collaboration and conversation around them. So, if you are also interested in these topics, please reach out. Um, I would very much like to uh, continue conversation about them. Today, I wanted to take the opportunity to first introduce the National and Regional Climate Adaptation Science Centers to all of you um, and briefly discuss the opportunities for project funding, as Sarah mentioned. Uh, you're more than welcome to follow up with me afterwards if you'd like additional information. Uh, there should be some time for Q&A after my talk, so we can either talk then or you can follow up individually with me via email. Um, the bulk of my talk will then describe this framework for how researchers can engage with stakeholders to produce actionable science and some guidance on how the framework can then be utilized. 
Um, and the framework is currently available via online early release at Weather, Climate, and Society. So um, you can go to the journal webpage and get a copy of the unformatted manuscript. And lastly, I'll touch on some additional considerations for producers of actionable science and some future directions for my research that I'm thinking about. So um, as we're all very well aware, climate change is already impacting natural and cultural resources throughout the US and globally. Just in the last couple of years, we experienced climate change driven record setting fire seasons in Australia, in the United States, in Brazil, and in many other parts of the world. In addition to altering the severity, intensity, and duration of the fire season, climate change will also influence what will occur on the landscape after fires are over. For fire and other climate-driven events, resource managers are increasingly turning to the scientific community for actionable tools and guidance on how best to adapt to current and projected future changes. Uh, there is a long history of the use of science in other fields of public policy, but calls for the creation of actionable science for climate adaptation have only increased in recent decades. The National and Regional Climate Adaptation Science Centers were created under the auspices of the US Department of the Interior and the US Geological Survey, which is a bureau under the Department of the Interior, in direct response to these calls. We fund and create climate impacts and adaptation science to support the management of natural and cultural resources. The three primary end user communities that we engage with are first other DOI bureaus, such as the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Bureau of Land Management, state fish and wildlife or fish and game agencies um, who have under their purview the management of individual uh, wildlife or fish species and their habitats, and then native and indigenous communities through the trust responsibilities the Bureau of Indian Affairs holds. The National CASC, so Climate Adaptation Science Center, abbreviated to CASC, um, was established by Congress in 2008. And subsequently, eight regional CASCs were created to focus on regional resource management priorities. Um, we are currently in the process of splitting the legacy Northeast region. So right here in this part of the continental US. It's uh, getting split into two, and we're fully standing up a ninth center, the Midwest cask. Um, and our domain fully covers the entire continental US, Alaska, Hawaii, the US affiliated Pacific Islands, and the US Caribbean. Each of these regional casks is a federal university partnership with each center housed at a host university selected through a competitive award process and supported by a consortium of partners. As Sarah mentioned, the North Central CAST is hosted at the University of Colorado Boulder. This innovative approach allows the regional CASTs access to a wide variety of expertise and skills that can be harnessed to do anything from conducting novel research to synthesizing existing information, to creating decision support tools, to providing technical training to partners. We work directly with natural and cultural resource managers, native and indigenous communities and other partners to create research and tools that can be applied to on the ground adaptation plans and decisions. This requires extensive often iterative engagement with partners to understand and meet their management challenges and science needs. Our projects integrate partners into the research, research process, allowing them to identify priority research questions, design experiments, and contribute to data collection and analysis. So um, here on the right is the map for the North Central Cask region. And it shows with the star, the host institution, 
the University of Colorado Boulder. And then each of the dots represents the consortium institutions that are part of the regional network. Um, the primary activity for each of our regional casts is funding projects and participating in research collaborations um, to address a range of management issues, uh, natural and cultural resources, and scientific questions. Uh, for the North Central region, we fund projects to, to address these um, four priority habitat systems that are listed there and six priority management issues. Ideas for projects are generally solicited on an annual basis, and primary investigators for proposals must either be a USGS scientist or an employee of a consortium institution, which of course includes CU Boulder. Um, each of the projects must describe the direct relevance of the science to a specific end user decision or plan or action as well as any ancillary stakeholder relevant outputs. So something has to be produced in addition to peer reviewed publications and scientific data. Um, and if anyone has questions about project ideas, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we do have a variety of processes through which we select and fund projects. Uh, you can also go to our website and see a list of, of currently or previously funded projects, and those can help give you ideas as to what we're really trying to look for. Um, over time, we've discovered that there's also still much science to be done on how to create actionable science. So this is where my own um, research fits in. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, I am working on my dissertation um, in parallel with working full time for the center. So I've tried to find an area where my research helps my job at the same time. And um, so just to kind of lay some groundwork, um, terms to describe the engagement of stakeholders in climate adapt adaptation research are used often imprecisely in the literature and can span a range of different approaches. Um, I just wanted to be clear and provide some definitions in this presentation. So I consider this a stakeholder to be an end user of the outputs and findings of a scientific process. Often in the CASC world, this is a resource manager or someone making a decision about how resources should be managed or allocated. But of course, this can span a wide range of end users um, all the way to the general public. Um, actionable science is scientific output or findings that are useful, usable, and used to support a management plan, decision, or action. And I, I think this is sometimes where we see a tension in the research to action um, spectrum, because we produce a lot of scientific outputs and findings that are useful and usable, but they don't always get used. And so that's where um, I think this um, science around the engagement of stakeholders or how to do actionable science is trying to improve that last link to used. And then stakeholder engagement is one process by which scientific outputs or findings can be made actionable. And that's really what this paper and this presentation are going to be um, focused on. I do want to say that I recognize that there is a colonial legacy to the term stakeholder. And following um, a paper by Sarki et al. from 2021, I suggest the term rights holder when working with tribal and indigenous communities um, because they are often governed by a complex set of treaties and um, legislation. But for this presentation, I continue to use the term stakeholder throughout um, just for brevity and also as an umbrella term for end user communities that span rights and non rights holders. Um, and then I just want to say up front, you know, stakeholder engagement for actionable science is founded on this 
assumed promise that the stakeholder input will impact the science. So the input will be used. And it's very easy for stakeholders to feel exploited if there's no clear pathway between their time and input and then the culmination of and self-benefit from the research project. So clearly defining and communicating the goals and approach to engagement is really, really imperative to building and sustaining trust. So laying out some of these definitions, um, laying out roles uh, for expected roles and contributions for stakeholders and researchers at the start of a project, it's time consuming and maybe something that people are not used to, but it can really rescue um, the trust relationship between a researcher and a stakeholder if it's done well and done up front. Uh, so the goals that I had with this paper were to propose a conceptual framework to characterize common stakeholder engagement approaches used to conduct actionable climate adaptation research. And the idea behind this framework was to both provide a standardized vocabulary for describing engagement, and then also to help researchers sort of navigate and select the approach that might best fit their scientific objectives. Um, and I argue that there is no individual best or optimal approach to engagement, and that selection of an uh, engagement approach is really highly context dependent. Um, a researcher's scientific objectives can, you know, it can help guide the selection of their engagement approach but you may actually need multiple approaches throughout the lifetime of a project as you build a stronger relationship with your partner or as you morph your project and move to new audiences. So no one size fits all sort of uh, solution here, but hopefully the framework gives people some structure that they can operate under to try to identify um, what approach they wanna move forward with. So the framework that I'm proposing is grounded in stakeholder engagement for community planning. And the foundational basis for it is Davidson's Wheel of Participation, which is shown on the left. Um, we selected this particular um, foundation because it includes some important concepts for climate adaptation specifically, such as the role of the stakeholder in the engagement and then the outcomes to the partnership. The wheel also represents a non-hierarchical structure that promotes a deliberate and thoughtful choice of a strategy instead of simply prioritizing the highest intensity of engagement. And often linear structures such as Arnstein's ladder of engagement, there's a, an implicit assumption that as you move up the ladder, you are somehow doing better. But here with the wheel, it's, it's sort of a non-hierarchical representation of your choices. Um, so following this wheel of participation and kind of building on some previous stakeholder engagement research, um, we classify approaches on a spectrum of inform, consult, participate, and empower. And um, here's a very simple adaptation of the information in the manuscript. Um, the INFORM approach is characterized by minimal interaction with stakeholders, focused on one-way communication of quality information. Um, you could imagine like a, a press release or a newsletter giving an update on findings, and it's from the researcher to the stakeholder. Um, the consult approach includes this active but limited communication, and it really kind of adds this flow of information back from stakeholder to researcher. And generally, that's through avenues such as focused surveys or public meetings. The participate approach is distinguished by fully active two-way partnership with stakeholders that provides them with some limited decision-making capabilities. So an example of that might be an advisory committee that you convene to provide input during regular points in your project. Um, 
And then lastly, the empower approach seeks to fully delegate or entrust stakeholders with significant decision making power uh, with the, the um, end goal being that they become co equal team members with the rest of their research team. So they're really considered um, co full co PIs on a project. And I'm going to run through each of these um, in a little bit more detail. So as I said, INFORM is this one-way communication of decision-relevant project results from researchers to stakeholders. Uh, and perhaps, unfortunately, the approach of informing an audience has been termed in the literature as the loading dock approach. Um, there's literature out there that says this is kind of like taking science, leaving it on the loading dock, and expecting that someone will just come pick it up. However, this one-way dissemination of information can be extremely useful when, for example, scientific legitimacy is needed outside of a political or policy context, or you may want to create and disseminate data sets with really broad geographical scale, or you may be trying to summarize a really large body of complex novel or synthetic science. Um, and one example of this INFORM approach is the provision of global climate projection data and graphics for researchers, managers, and the public at large by the Coupled Model Inner Comparison Project, so CMIP, which um, supports the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, IPCC. Um, so all of that production of climate data occurs sort of pretty independent of the stakeholder community, but then is followed um, by a dissemination of these products with public discourse to increase their saliency. The original transfer of science for public action is this one-way knowledge transfer, and then it can be followed by a lot of engagement. So in that case, you know, you may want very um, important information that will be used for major policy undertakings to be independent of those policy undertakings and to be created in a, in a completely disconnected, independent manner. Consult seeks to access stakeholder input on pre-identified options at specific waypoints in the process when it may not be necessary to really deeply understand the decision-making context of the science. And this kind of engagement doesn't necessarily need to be sustained throughout a project, doesn't need to be iterative. Um, and like I said, it can take the form of surveys, workshops, town halls. Um, often consulting with stakeholders happens during three distinct phases of a research project. Um, often there's the needs assessment phase, design and implementation, and then products and outputs. And for example, in really large synthetic science activities, such as the National Climate Assessment, um, stakeholders will be engaged to define thresholds for analyses that appear in the report. And then the team will go away generate synthetic results, um, draft maybe a first iteration of the report, and then stakeholders will be re-engaged during the review process to provide comment on um, whether the products actually meet their needs. So, you know, this kind of engagement for the National Climate Assessment um, occurs because they have created this really robust community of interagency and interinstitutional working groups. And they have a federal steering committee that coordinates all of those pieces. So you can kind of imagine that for a complex project, you may have some targeted communities that you would engage with at a few, like three key points in your project, um, but they're not maybe integrated into any of the work that's done. Participate encompasses a range of engagement methods whereby researchers and stakeholders share some decision-making. So unlike consult, participate represents some sustained two-way interaction 
although the length of time and type of interaction can vary. So one, one way to do this is through iterative engagement with either the same or different groups of stakeholders at defined points in a project's life cycle to ensure that concerns and aspirations are mutually understood. And despite the substantial sustained engagement over what might be a period of months or years, stakeholders are not fully integrated into the project team and often do not participate in the work that happens between these discrete touch points. So one really common use of such an approach is um, when researchers are trying to develop tangible project products, such as decision support tools um, for stakeholders to use and access uh, data produced by projects. And an example um, is that the Na National Drought Mitigation Center uses interactive workshops and um, scenario-based exercises. So trying to play games that are um, models of actual decisions to really understand how resource managers and policymakers interact with each other to choose priority resources, build coalitions, and respond to and assess the impacts of a drought. Um, when uh, NDMC collects this information, they use it to inform how they present observational and model data in support of planning and decision processes. So, the way a map is created, the colors that are used, all of that can really be informed by this deep participatory engagement with stakeholders. But, you know, the actual development of the map happens with the research team and not with the stakeholder um, involved. And lastly, um, as in participate, approaches within Empower require sustained two-way interaction between stakeholders and researchers. In Empower approaches, however, stakeholders are included as co-equal team members through every step of the project. They are entrusted to make project decisions and they engage in project work between interactions. In order to build and sustain the partnerships needed for Empower approaches, researchers and stakeholders must dedicate significant resources within the project, such as time or money, towards this engagement. Empower approaches can be particularly effective when projects take place within contexts where the voices of particular stakeholders or rights holders have been muted or disenfranchised in decision-making processes. Empowerment of stakeholders can result in fundamental shifts in power and governance by placing equal importance on information from diverse knowledge systems and by allowing for more holistic representations of human nature connectedness that are informed by the ethics of care. As a result, Empower can support the creation of place-based science where local knowledge is critical in the implementation of science-informed plans, decisions, or actions. And I'll dig deeper into this in a couple of slides, but um, this is, you know, from my perspective, the recommended approach if your project plans to um, involve any Native or Indigenous communities. Um, some representation of those communities needs to be uh, integrated into the project at the full co-equal team level and be providing input on key project decisions throughout um, the, the project's lifetime. And so what do you kind of do with all of this information? Um, what we have done is uh, create these sort of guiding thought questions. Um, as I said before, you know, I don't think that there's any individual best approach to engagement. Um, and you may need to use multiple approaches through uh, a project or while working with different stakeholders on the same project. So we have put these guiding thought questions um, together that researchers can use when selecting an approach. And we've provided some sample endpoint answers um, along this inform consult 
participate in power spectrum that researchers can use to gauge where their answer to each thought question falls. Um, so for example, the first question is, to what degree do the products need scientific legitimacy above the political or policy context? And on the inform end of the spectrum, legitimacy comes from complete scientific independence. And on the empower end of the spectrum, legit legitimacy comes from the engagement process. So your results will be legitimate because the stakeholders were involved in the creation of the results. Um, and so if you answer these questions, you could think of multiple answers clustering under a single approach, providing an indicator of what kind of engagement a researcher can explore for their project. And conversely, if your answers span a range of approaches, that might indicate the need to use multiple approaches in your project or trying to use multiple methods that kind of achieve different project objectives. So um, just to, to provide some guidance on how to use the framework um, when you're actually trying to develop a, an engagement um, plan for a proposal or trying to justify the resources that you are asking for um, to support the plan that you think is necessary. Um, so to kind of recap, uh, a project may elect to inform stakeholders when providing some rapid response information and a crisis situation, maybe when working with a homogenous or well-studied community or responding to needs that have been sort of clearly articulated already. Um, consulting stakeholders could be appropriate when your stakeholder community is really large and diverse. Um, while using participatory approaches may work best when your stakeholders and their needs are really able to be well-defined. Empowering your stakeholders may be an option when your project is addressing a complex non-time sensitive issue or in decision contexts where a shift in the balance of power between stakeholders needs to occur. So I've given a really quick overview of each of these approaches in this presentation. But if you do go look at the manuscript, um, there's a much richer discussion of methods and techniques for each approach um, that you can use for implementation. And then also there's some discussion of the barriers that you might face when implementing any of these strategies and what you might wanna think about in order to overcome those barriers. So. That's my plug for saying, go read my paper. <laughs> and so for some, just some key takeaways, you know, the level of technical complexity or degree of interdisciplinarity can be important elements of the project context. They don't always tell the whole story and they can be misleading if those are the only elements that you consider. So you need to kind of take a, a whole project approach and a whole decision context approach when thinking about your stakeholder engagement plan. And for example, you may need extensive stakeholder engagement in a project that is focused on running a physical model in order to determine the appropriate par parameterization for key variables. On the other hand, you may choose to do really light stakeholder engagement for a complex social ecological system study when the community needs have already been assessed and they're well understood and well documented. Um, and then you may need to revisit this framework over a project to kind of think through, you know, have the has that whole project view um, changed or shifted? Do you need to make adjustments to your engagement plan? Um, have you realized that's, that there's a deficiency somewhere? Um, but the most important part of utilizing this framework is just understanding the context of the project and ensuring that you're investing in the right kind of engagement to meet your stakeholder science needs. Um, you may have uh, resource constraints or other barriers that dictate um, how you choose an approach and require that you kind of balance these transaction costs of greater stakeholder interaction, 
and expected gains in the quality and quantity of outputs and outcomes. I'm not advocating that you reserve you know, a large chunk of your budget in every project to do stakeholder engagement. I think there are projects where it's perfectly appropriate to not have stakeholder engagement and you can still create actionable science. Um, and that's, that's totally okay. <laughs> Uh, you, you just need to understand why you're picking that approach and be able to justify it. So I'm hoping that this framework and the information in the paper can help scientists um, make that argument. Some um, additional considerations going forward. I do want to encourage researchers to keep in mind cultural and ethical elements when selecting an approach. And like I said, to default to the use of empower approaches when working with traditionally muted or disenfranchised groups. Um, and like I said, when you're engaging with native or tribal or indigenous communities, um, it's really, really important to start with um, what Kyle White calls a justice forward mindset, um, which means that you move past addressing only historical wrongdoing and you start actively leading the removal of institutional and bureaucratic obstructions that are preventing our partner communities from flourishing. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and what I have up here is a figure from a recently published paper by Wilmer et al. And it describes an expanded set of ethical principles that re researchers should consider when conducting transdisciplinary research. And these extended principles remind us that while stakeholder engagement, it's not considered human subjects research and it does not fall under the oversight of an institutional review board, um, all researchers really need to keep in mind that there are tipping points around the areas of consent, trust, accountability, and responsibility, which may result in permanent and irreversible relational damage if crossed. Um, stakeholder engagement, it's not human subjects research, but it can do real harm. And that leads me to um, my own future research. So what I'm working on right now is um, examining the role that the ethical principles established by this um, 1979 Belmont report um, and, and what role those principles can play in informing ethical stakeholder engagement. Um, for any of you who have done IRB training or who have had to seek IRB approval for your research, you're familiar with this report. Uh, it was really you know, created out of a concern um, following uh, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments and some other violations of human rights. Uh, on how to ethically conduct research on human subjects. But the core principles that this report outlines are um, you know, respect for persons, which is that uh, each individual fully and freely gives consent to participate in research. Beneficence, which is that researchers are doing no harm. And justice, researchers are not exploiting vulnerable populations. All three of these core principles can be conceptually extended to conducting research with human partners. And um, so what I'm currently doing is analyzing uh, interviews that we conducted with stakeholders who were um, who participated in climate adaptation research projects to better understand their perspectives on how researchers upheld some of these principles in those projects? And are there some good practices or pitfalls that can be identified um, by, by looking at what our stakeholders are saying about their experiences um, in, in uh, working on research? And so my research is trying to argue that bad engagement can sometimes cause more relational harm than conducting no engagement. Um, especially if inadequate consideration is given to why stakeholders must be engaged and how their contributions will be incorporated into a project. And I do plan to share the results of this research at the AGU fall meeting in December. 
Um, HGU hasn't made decisions about presentation format yet, so I'm not sure what format this will take, but it's in the session listed on the slide and the presentation title is The Road to Co-Production is Paved with Good Intentions. And so um, I'm going to stop here and I want to thank you all for listening to this talk. Um, you're welcome to either contact me by email, my emails on the slide for additional information about this um, content and you can check out our uh, weather, climate, and society manuscript for some additional detail. And then um, you can check out the CASC website, cask.usgs.gov, for more information about the network of regional centers and the science that we fund. So happy to turn it over to our fearless facilitators for Q&A.